Hi, Liz. Okay, wait. First and foremost, let me make sure everybody can hear both of us. Check, check, check. Can you hear me? And check. Yeah, you say check, check, check. Check, check. <laughs> can you hear both of us? I'm laughing too, Brianna. You're so cute. I'm just waiting to see if people can check, check. Okay. Yes, said check. Yes, loud and clear. Yes, you can hear Liz. Hey, Liz. Everyone says, hey, Liz. Oh, my God. <laughs> Someone said, Little Miss Martian said, oh, my God, she's so young. I always expect <laughs> therapists to be over 40. <laughs> be this year, so I'm getting there. <laughs> no, that's so young. And I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you for being here. Um, yes, of course. I am... I'm excited. I know her drip. I know. I know. Everybody's like her drip. Yo, what the hell? <laughs> she's like crazy with the drip. And I'm like, I, yeah, I'm, yeah, she's amazing. So, okay. So for those of you who don't know who Liz is, Liz B. Croft, right? Mm -hmm. And you look um, incredible and beautiful. Like you look like an artist, not a therapist, <laughs> which I think personally is really cool because that makes you so much more relatable to, you know, you know, maybe even like younger people trying to get into therapy who are, you know, nervous to start therapy. I got a lot of questions that were about that. It's like how um, one of them was like advice for people that are too shy to open up and like advice for people who, you know, want to start therapy, but had a bad experience with another therapist. And so we can talk about that. There's so many great questions. And yes, make sure to follow Liz on Instagram. She's the coolest and like also like fashion icon. <laughs> okay, so first and foremost, you're Liz B. Croft and you're so cool, but you're also a therapist. Yes, I am. How did you end up getting into therapy? Yeah, so I had my own struggles with mental health since I was really young. And, you know, this is something we've chatted about yes. behind the scenes, but, you know, just struggling with homesickness and anxiety. Um, and then as I, you know, got older in college, I had a pretty bad breakup um, that resulted in, you know, trigger warning, but I had overdosed, um, mm. ended up in the hospital and came back into therapy at that time. Uh, and when I was in college, I was a bio major. I really wanted to be an orthodontist. Put so braces cool. <laughs> but um, after having that experience with my therapist, I kind of realized that I wanted to help people in a different capacity. So I decided to pursue psychology, change my major. And then, you know, after I graduated undergrad, I wasn't really sure what exactly I wanted to do still with a psych degree. So then I kind of took a step back. I took a year off and then decided to apply for social work grad programs. So I ended up moving to New York City, went to NYU for my master's in social work and I loved it. And then, and here I am That's now. Amazing. amazing. <laughs> and so did it take a lot of school to get to the point where you could, where you were like an official therapist? Yeah. I mean, so it, four years of undergrad and then depending on what you study in undergrad like if you study psychology then your grad program is two years but if you study social work in undergrad then your grad program is only one year um so yeah six years total wasn't nearly as much as I would have had to have done if I went to like dental school to do the orthodontics yeah. but um still a good amount and uh but I would say it was like the perfect amount because I don't realistically think I could have done any more. <laughs> yeah. But so to be a psychiatrist, it takes probably like 10 years of school or something, right? Yeah. I used to go to medical school That's for that. crazy. Okay. That's, oh my gosh. Bless anyone doing that. That's a lot of school. <laughs> okay. So the, so the first question actually was, any advice for somebody who knows they need a therapist but haven't revealed their mental health issues to those that are close to them yet? Yeah. I mean, that's something that, you know, I think is a perk of going to therapy. Yeah. You know, sometimes opening up to other people is really difficult, and especially so the ones close to us, because those people can be biased at times and not necessarily for a, a negative way, but sometimes a positive way. And so I think 
you know, therapists are trained professionals who are non-biased. Yeah. Um, and it's everything is confidential. So you don't ever have to really worry about anything. It's the greatest thing about therapy, honestly. Like I opened up about things that I had been holding on to since, you know, trauma, since I was a little, little kid. And I opened up to my therapist, only person in the entire universe that I've opened up to. And, you know, it's, it changed my life truly. And it's like, there's no one else that I could have gone to. And in somebody who, you know, is trained to take you through those steps. And it's like, there's no judgment. It's completely confidential. And they're going to, you know, walk you through the steps to, to not only, you know, of course, it's nice to get off your chest, but then, you know, they have ways of therapists have ways of actually helping you through it. And, you know, in a really productive way, that's going to like, actually, you know, help you get better. So, so yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, therapy changed my life. So thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> the One of the first things that stood out to me was I was listening to a podcast. It was when Liz had just started her first podcast. And uh, I was like, oh, this is really cool. You know, a, a younger girl, you know, female woman, empowered woman who struggled but is having this like successful dope career now. And when I was listening to it, the thing that stuck with me was it gives me chills. I always say that like I'm just so affected by things like physically. Um, but one of the things was you were talking about how your anxiety was really triggered from homesickness. And that like hit me so hard because that was such a thing for me. I mean, I used to not be able to even be in the next aisle in Target from my mom. Like I would have to like be next to her holding her, you know, or her holding me. And um, it got really, it got really bad. And, and so I thought it was really interesting that I was kind of, you know, the mental health kind of thing that you struggled with too. Um, is there anything you could like tell us about that or like what you did to kind of like get over it? Not get over it, but get help kind of? Yeah, I mean... So for me, when I first started experiencing it was, you know, when I would go away to basketball camps, I grew up playing basketball my whole life, even in college I played, but that's kind of when I noticed it when I'd have to go away for a week or a weekend and be away. Mm -hmm. And I would just go into full panic mode. Mm -hmm. I would have panic attacks and it felt very isolating because, you know, my teammates didn't really struggle with this. Everyone kind of was looking at me like, what's wrong with you? Why, yeah. you know? And it got to a point where my parents would, like, have to get a hotel room near wherever. Oh, <laughs> oh I relate to this so much. <laughs> I because it's, like, I'm very grateful that I had parents who were able to do that, you know. And yeah. just, like, even thinking, like, that's not even an option for some people. Oh, yeah. So or parents who aren't understanding and are, like, you're being dramatic. Get over it. Like, I'm not coming out there, you know. So, yeah. That's, yeah. So, yeah, it was, I don't even know, like, I mean, for me, like, looking back now as a therapist, what got over it, what helped me get over it was, like, exposure hierarchies, essentially, which is, like, you know, kind of, this is the way I describe it to my clients, is, you know, you think you're playing Mario, right, and Bowser's Castle is, like, the final stage, and you have to be all these other levels mm -hmm. to get up to the yeah. final stage. The final stage is, like, the thing that makes you the most anxious, right, so for me, it was homesickness, staying over at a basketball camp, so, I had to build myself up. I had to start with smaller things that made me feel anxious. So like staying over a neighbor's house or staying over my mm. grandmother's house um, until I defeated that stage and, and was able to prove to myself that I was able to get over it. And then eventually like it came to the point where I had, it was at Bowser's castle. I had to get over <laughs> the homesickness. So my mom also kind of added to that because she was at her wits end just like you know I don't know what else it can do so she was it was ninth grade of high school and she was like look if you stay over I will get you any concert tickets oh so, guess what I want to see Jesse McCartney oh <laughs> sick one. shout out Jesse he's a friend he's such a sweetheart <laughs> uh, Jesse McCartney and exposure hierarchies was essentially what got me through but it, it was like having to prove to myself that as long as I can do it, like yeah. nothing bad is going to happen. And those anxieties that I had, like I had to basically like Socratic question myself by experience to prove that like nothing is going to happen. Um, yeah, I find that experience definitely 
having a good experience, just like having a bad experience, but having a good experience of something definitely progresses you into the right, you know, Mm -hmm. into the right direction that you want to go. And for me, it was similar with when, so I had that, like, it was so bad when I was a kid, I couldn't be away from my parents at all. And then it started coming back. It was really weird. It went away. And then it started coming back when I started doing shows. And it was the exact same feeling. Like, It was at the, you know, I felt it really hard. I remember I was at um, uh, Firefly and, you know, this was one of my like first festival shows a few years ago and I was alone in my green room and I just like, I started panicking and started like throwing up and it was like, it was when the guy came, uh, the guy working who bless his soul he was so sweet he like talked me through this it was so sweet but so he came to my room my green room and he was like hey we gotta go to stage and it was like it was that feeling of like I want my mommy I want my mommy like that like panicked feeling and I was like what is this like why are you back like what are you doing and 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 I remember being really really young maybe like seven and I was in a Chili's and I was with my grandfather and my brother and I, and the food came and instantly I was like I just started panicking and I went to the bathroom and I started throwing up and my parents weren't there but there was I remember there was this woman in a in the bathroom who had blue acrylic nails and I was like and I was like I need to find that woman because it was like finding like mommy like I needed that like mommy thing and I'm I mean I'm still trying to break that and it's just our brains are so strange mm-hmm. um so 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 strange so I relate so much to what you're saying and it was it was weird that it came back when I started doing shows and it was like this feeling of like I I I don't know maybe like maybe it's a being trapped thing I don't know but like it I love the visual that you said about the uh Mario Mario. yeah and it's like so hard to explain you know like it's so hard to explain explain yeah especially like that's why I write about it in song form because you know I'm hallucinating saying that is like that's dissociation to me like that's not I'm not I don't take drugs I've never done drugs I'm too scared I'm too anxious to take drugs and like me saying I'm hallucinating is like me saying I'm fucking dissociating like really bad you know and um and what was really beautiful about putting out that music is that you know other people started coming to me saying I have the same experiences and it was like whoa like I'm writing this just because I thought I was the only one and I had nowhere else to like put these thoughts and feelings and there's so many people that go through this and I even started to realize there were so many people in the spotlight that go through it who would come to me and obviously I would never name names but come to me like hey I don't know what to do I'm like having such bad panic and anxiety and these are like artists that are you know much bigger artists than me and it's just it's interesting how people are afraid to talk about it and so I'm, I'm so grateful that you're here and you're talking about it um I have more questions <laughs> um okay so one of the other ones okay one of the first ones was as a therapist does your mind get mixed up as well as helping others out or do you constantly have to remind yourself of your tactics or does it become natural oh (laughs) (laughs) I've always wondered this too actually absolutely not I'm a human being I go to my own therapist you know so you're still in therapy I'm in therapy amazing they're like a good therapist goes to therapy yeah that's amazing have to because we're carrying like all of our caseloads <laughs> trying to remember all of our yeah. client informations histories and and it's a lot and like sometimes there's things that you really really resonate with within a client and you're seeing like you're having that like counter transference and yeah. those emotions that like you have to kind of keep in for this for the sake of the like therapeutic relationship and yeah it's it's heavy work at times and I think you know having my own outlets like sneakers um <laughs> yeah um, you know I have a cat so I try to <laughs> cooking, things like that that really like just force me to be present in the moment and yeah. and create the separation between like my personal life and my hobbies and just self-care in general versus like my work um with my clients yeah yeah so so at times it can almost feel triggering in a way to hear uh-huh. other stories it's really it's really awesome that you're still in therapy Uh, and it's almost similar like to like if 
you know, a musician is like still goes and has lessons. And like, I think that you can, as a human being, you can always learn more and always learn from peers or people, you know, who are, have been doing it much longer than you. And, and I just want to like remind everybody that's watching, you know, there are therapists out there like Liz who are relatable and who, you know, are very calm and, and therapy is so, so amazing. And there are ways to find affordable therapy too, right? I mean, yeah. are there any, like, do you know any, like, secrets that we don't know about finding, you know, less expensive, you know, one-on-one -on -one therapy? Yeah, absolutely. There's a resource called Open Path Collective, um, and that's essentially a network of therapists who offer sliding scale rates. Um, oh, wow, cool. And also, like, if you find a therapist that you really, really like, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason their price is, you know, out of budget, I don't like don't count them out at least schedule that consultation and call them and just explain your situation like therapists myself included like if we have a full caseload of say like 20 to 30 clients like we typically keep a couple spots open specifically for sliding scale clients because yeah. we know like there's it's the reality of it um I was really lucky yeah, yeah my therapist um I was you know you know, being an artist, it's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you think that people have money and they don't, um, you know, it's like, we put it all into our art and, um, and my therapist was so wonderful, you know, it was like, well, I'm like $280 an hour. That's a lot of money. And, you know, it was like, okay, well, what can you afford? Like I'm here and I actually do want to help you. And eventually, you know, you know, when you have all this success, if you want to pay me the full rate, like, that'd be awesome. <laughs> but, but it is true. A lot of times, you know, I, I've had that experience. A lot of times they will, you know, talk with you through it and, you know, see what you can afford. And therapists, you know, like yourself, it's like your job, like you want to help people. That's like, that's why you do what you do. And so I, you know, I think a lot of therapists have, you know, really good hearts. And, and I feel sad for anyone that's had a bad experience with therapy. And I, I really like wouldn't want that to sour the experience. So the another question is any tips on how to re I love this question, how to recharge, but also feel fulfilled that day, like you're, you know, accomplishing things and, you know, feeling fulfillment throughout that day. But, um, you know, but really taking the time to recharge. Yeah. You know, a quote that I love is celebrate the small victories. Mm, I um, love that. You know, because those tiny, tiny little incremental things that we just take for granted sometimes yeah. are big and are worthy of being celebrated whether it just be getting out of bed that day and, and making your bed or cooking yourself a meal like it's things so like true. that yeah and and just like those tiny little things you know like equate and add up to the big goals you know so yeah a lot of stuff I do with clients is like kind of breaking things down into little tiny tiny bits to you know help not because sometimes when you're looking at the big picture oh my gosh right? it's so daunting <laughs> and it, it creates a lot of anxiety you know yeah. so it's kind of reframing even how you see those goals and um and also just being you know celebrating the fact that you listen to your body that you needed to recharge yeah. um, that's a for yourself uh, I th I totally agree and I went through that too where it's like you know I'm going 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 and then it's like you know but you you really do need to recharge and and this uh my dear friend chase gray is who asked that question and it's so funny because i always tell him he's such a light and i always tell him you have to let yourself recharge you have to have those days because any light you know you can be the brightest light but you're gonna like burn out and i'm like that too i have like really really hyper and you know just like talking to everybody and then you know i have to have down days where I'm just like okay I'm gonna like lay here and that in itself is an accomplishment because you're recharging yourself like you have to do that you know um and I like how you said making the bed there's little steps like that for me that helps so much just like make me feel like or I recently I started making these like a uh, little just checklist for the day it could be like go to the UPS store and then like or like set up your like new credit card like whatever and then just like checking it off I'm like oh like I feel like I did something <laughs> so I love that um okay <laughs> another question was how do you cope with big and uncomfortable life changes 
Oh, you know, I think that's a question that is, it really does depend on the person and yeah. what, you know, works best for you. Because I think, you know, even with therapy, with anything, like mental health is something that we in some capacity can generalize, but we can't because everyone experiences things very uniquely and our own experiences are our experiences. So, you know, with big life changes, I think just reflecting, like really taking the time, whether it be through journaling, whether it be through just sitting with your thoughts for a couple of minutes a day, meditating, meditating, if that's, you know, something you're into, or just like talking it out with like someone who you respect and you know find support in like being able to just like do whatever works for you in those situations to cope um yeah is important but yeah it's it's tough because life changes big life changes are are overwhelming oh, um, completely and you know and everybody's experience is different but then there are you know so many similarities that we all kind of go through especially it's like life changes are hard for anybody and then like you know put your you know somebody who's struggling f- you know with their own mental health is like add that on top and it's you know it's it feels impossible but it's not um it really I I love that you know sitting and being with your thoughts and journaling and and also you know kind of reflecting too on how far you've come and how you know really reflecting on that has been beautiful for me you know feeling like okay I have you know come this far or whatever but yeah it is life is hard that's the thing it's like even every therapist in the world it's like we're all human beings at the end of the day and it's like you know therapy is incredible and you know I've it's changed my life so much and been so helpful but at the end of the day it's like life changes I remember talking to my therapist about this like she went through her um, husband passing away and it was like you know and that's one of my things is like I can't I can't even fathom you know dealing with somebody dying I can't I it's it spins me out it's why I started medication and you know I was like well how, how, like are you okay like how did you you know deal she's like I'm still dealing with it like it's I'm a human like you know I'm not I'm not superhuman because I'm a therapist <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely and that's like I think that's the biggest misconception too is like people think like if you work in the mental health field or your therapist like you have your shit together <laughs> and like, I'll be honest there's times I definitely don't yeah um, <laughs> And it also creates a lot of imposter syndrome for therapists. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, really? I, I suffer with that a lot with art, being an artist. I know even the biggest artists, you know, feel that way. And so that's really interesting. What does that kind of feel like? It's tough because it's like, you know, here I am doing this like conversation with you, like preaching all this stuff. And then there's times where I'm like, yeah, do I always practice what I preach? No, right. like <laughs> I don't. Um <laughs> And not that I, like, intentionally neglect it, but, like, you know, sometimes your emotions are so strong that, like, you're not even in a mind state where you can remember, like, oh, I need to do my deep breathing or yeah. my grounding skills or, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, for me, know, hearing you say that, it's, like, yeah. it makes me feel less alone because, yeah. you know, like, with Instagram and, you know, seeing these perfect lifestyles of people and it's, like, you really do start to feel alone and you're like, am I the only person that's going through this? Like, is there something wrong with me? Um, well, I feel so alone. So, you know, I think it's really nice when you, know, I think it's like awesome to hear you say that because, you know, we all are human beings and, you know, we all struggle and life is really hard. And this last year has been crazy. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's been a, whirlwind of the year and a lot of time to sit with your thoughts and sometimes that's not always the best thing for us but. I know yeah you know what it, getting out of my own head you know things have been helping me like going for walks during this time has been really great or even just going outside and like touching a plant or something it's just like things that kind of ground you and get you out of that I'm somebody I love watching television um I don't know if it's like the best coping mechanism but that's just like it's the thing that works for me a lot. Um, this is an interesting question, I thought, because I'm a big dreamer. Um, so the question was thoughts on lucid dreams and how they affect our consciousness 
feel free to say like hell no I'm not talking about this or or any of these questions you can be like next (laughs) but I thought that was a cool one because I dream a lot so I'm interested I'll be honest like dream psychology is not one of my yeah wait so there is there are dream psychologists I mean it's like a a dream psychology I'm pretty sure Freud was the one who like kind of tapped into it and just like you know, and there's not, I don't know that there's like a ton of research out there to prove that like things are true. It's just yeah. more of like theories and, and things like that. But I've never really looked into it. I never really had to with like my experience. Yeah. It was, it was something it, do you on. dream? Uh, no. You I mean, don't? I don't remember. I mean, I'm sure I do, but I don't. <laughs> you don't remember I, them? I, wait, what? You don't remember them? And I, I'm like, I, I wake up frequently throughout the night. Oh, wow. I, so I'm like oh. water like I get up and I have to pee like, <laughs> it's just like so. I'm like such a d- maybe I need to like find somebody that knows if comment if you know about dream psychology is that what it is called <laughs> it's so cool yeah. I find it really fascinating because I'm like I'm on the like tip of being able to lucid dream and but I'm kind of scared to activate that because of my mental you know health stuff and just like how wild my mind is I'm I'm afraid to access it and I know the way to access it I think is like you draw you write down your dreams as soon as you wake up and I know I'm like on the verge and I'm just I'm too scared to I'm too scared to go there <laughs> okay let's see if there's uh, okay uh oh this is all oh, oh this one I just want to make my heart hurt. Do you have any strategies for coping with self-loathing? So actually it's interesting. Like self-loathing, self-esteem, self-confidence are kind of all like cousins of one another. Yeah. Um, one I would say is like really just find those mantras and affirmations that work for you and align with who you are and, and you know, what's a good fit. Um, and whether you write those down each morning, whether you look at yourself in the mirror and you say them, it's really a lot about like trying to, you know, battle that inner critic and those inner thoughts that play a role in self-loathing and also tapping into, you know, and reflecting on maybe where those thoughts come from, what kind of experiences maybe have shaped those thoughts or, you know, if, but I really too would like suggest like therapy like therapy is a really really good place to kind of explore that and yeah. a safe place um yeah there you know there's there's quite a, a few different things but I would start off with like affirmations writing down things you're grateful for mm, writing yeah. down each day just like <clears throat> thinking about the good things that you accomplished that day you know the small victories yeah. um, gratitude but- is like you know it really does change your mindset when you start to think from a space of gratitude even if it's like the most simple thing I am so grateful for like clean water that I'm drinking right now I'm so grateful to like be able to lift this by myself you know or like just the smallest things I'm 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 so grateful that I just opened my eyes you know even just those tiny little things are just just changing your thought process I think my mom like taught me a lot about that but like and my dad as well like just switching that you know just wake up like I'm gonna I'm gonna think positively today and I'm gonna be grateful today and you know just like put out gratitude and it's so I remember once my brother I was was struggling in school and he said because I had moved schools and he said he's like tomorrow just go to school and try just smiling because I was feeling really like just down on myself and he's like just honestly be around people like just smile smile (laughs) and I tried it and it actually it just you know you kind of have to like trick your brain sometimes to think like you know and of course it's it's okay to also you know lay in bed and (laughs) sulk for a day as well I've definitely done that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, and that can be a recharging thing but yeah I think that's really it's so important to sort of like switch your mind and you know think of think of things that you're grateful for even if it's the tiniest thing just like putting positivity into your mind and like into your aura it, it honestly does change and it sounds so like 
yeah. you know, like, yeah. oh, right, okay, you know, but it really does. And of course, you know, these, this is like everyday kind of things, you know, I, a lot of times people are like, oh, I was talking about this, like, oh, like, I can't find my remote. It's giving me like an anxiety attack. And it's like, well, no, like, that's not an anxiety attack, <laughs> you know? So these things are like kind of, you know, journaling, uh, you know, practicing gratitude and positivity. These are like everyday things that you can do. I'm on medication. Like I, I had to start medication. And when I was going through panic attacks, like I and dissociation, I was a different person. Like I, you know, the people around me experiencing it also saw that and were like, like, you know, they almost didn't recognize me. And then when I would snap out of it, we could actually have a discussion about it, which was, you know, changed their whole perspective of mental health. And we're like, I didn't know people went through that because people think like, you know, a little stress here and there. These journaling and these things to practice are to practice every day. So also like maybe when you are having that anxiety or panic attack, you know, maybe it's just a little bit like less and or maybe it's like a little bit easier to get out of because you've been practicing you know keeping your mind positive and stuff and I really do think that stuff works um but that's more like I would say everyday stuff you know when you're you know struggling especially right now it's like really beautiful things that you can do and kind of just like training your brain to chill <laughs> I would do that <laughs> I know same (laughs) um okay so another question my anxiety and depression keeps me from being able to work so I am jobless how do I forgive myself for that that's not really it's I I think a lot of people are feeling that right now so how do you forgive yourself for being jobless because your anxiety and depression has you know kept you from being able to work I would say, you know, again, going back into those affirmations, but maybe, you know, tweaking them a little bit to say things like, I accept that I, you know, struggle with anxiety and depression and my anxiety and depression at times make it hard for me to do Hmm. certain things, you know, throughout the day or maintain certain things. Um, And I think it's really about acceptance and not trying to push away things that sometimes are out of our control. Yeah, you're so right. We really can only control what we can control. And, you know, if that means upping your self-care game to the point where, like, it it can help, you know, with some of those symptoms and you can get to a point where, you know, it it might be safe and feel safe to to work, then so be it. But, you know, if those there are factors that are out of your control, like really honing in on those affirmations and, and just getting to a point of ex- acceptance um and that's not easy like I'm not it's yeah not <laughs> thing like that takes that might be something to explore like going to therapy for um you know go even going on the websites like Pinterest and looking up some like journaling prompts and oh, finding cool. I love that idea that, that resonate with you I mean there's a lot on there and yeah. there's some that are gonna be good some that might not be a good fit but you know, really writing and, and kind of reflecting too and reading back what you wrote and seeing if you can notice any themes or patterns, you know, or um, have any like mental breakthroughs when you kind of revisit that. I know for me writing and, uh, you know, journaling, which sometimes like, sometimes like hearing like meditation journaling, we all want to just like be like, oh God, like, <laughs> please. But like, honestly when you really do like sit yourself down and do these things and practice these things like I really find that they do work and like even if you just write like on a page even if you're just like doing that like thing where you just write anything that's in your mind like I really do find that it it does help it's crazy and you know again of course you know when you're in the middle of like the most intense panic or anxiety attack or like depression episode like you know at times like there's nothing like that that can get you out but these are like everyday practices that I think are really you know wonderful and I think you know it is really important to you know really do seek therapy and because my therapist you know I I saw my therapist for over a year before she sort of like she's like I've been waiting to like notice you know certain things with you or if certain things would change and she was like you know 
she she sat me down and she said I, I think you would really benefit from seeing a psychiatrist and like you know potentially going on medication and for me I was like what that's so scary like hell no that's crazy and she was like okay there's you can either like you know go through life and feel the same there's this medication that can actually you know potentially really help you and and it, and it did help me a lot and I wish I could I wish I could have done it without medication and maybe I could have but at that point in my life like I think you know I really I really did need it and I think these are things that like you should not be ashamed of at all because so many people go through this when when I actually started medication I was so petrified I didn't tell my parents I didn't tell anyone I was like so scared because I grew up like all organic and not taking any medication and whatever and um but I was so scared and then you know I I would open up to a couple people and they're like oh like a friend that I knew for years she's like oh I was on that for 10 years I was like what like I had no idea so a lot of people are going through this I think it's like you know, so I think practicing these like daily meditative, like wonderful journaling things, you know, going for walks or exercising, these things are like daily things that you should be doing to help your brain and they will help you. Um, and I know how hard it is. Like even just like for me, you know, at times it was like getting out of bed was an accomplishment. Walking out of the front door was an accomplishment. Getting my nails done was like an accomplishment or something, you know? So even just like celebrating those little victories, as you said. Um, yeah. and that's the thing with medicine. Like when you take medication or they, you know, that conversation comes up in therapy, it's always like a really scary conversation because there are so many stigmas associated with medication. Yeah. You know, a lot of side effects, rightfully so. But yeah, when, you know, I, one way I kind of try and describe it to my clients is sometimes the reason we need medication isn't because we're not able to get over something or that we don't have the willpower. It's literally something that is out of our control. Like so true. it's trying to help balance those chemicals in our brains, you know, and, and just as much as if we had like a vitamin D deficiency, we'd have to take, exactly. you know, so we, these medications have those chemicals and the, the, chemistry in them that will help the chemicals yeah. in our brain kind of recalibrate um that's how I would I would always think about it like my you know my my brain just needs a little bit of like rewiring right now and <laughs> um and, and I think that's kind of like a really nice way to think about that so I'm glad that you say that it's you know uh, Okay, you said that you went through a bad heartbreak or, like, bad relationship. One of the questions was, what are some ways that you found help with heartbreak and kind of, like, dealing with that? <laughs> I'll be honest. Like, it really, really messed with my self-esteem. Yeah. Um, oh, my gosh, yeah. It was – so it was actually two back-to-back, -back, like, breakups where the person had cheated on me. Oh, and, no. Oh, you know, that plays a – that's a – takes a toll on your mental health you yeah know, you, well, you, would you say that's trauma yeah I mean, like yeah. some form of trauma yeah for me it definitely was and yeah I just felt like it was my fault like I wasn't good enough you know all yeah. those like, terrible thoughts that you say to yourself up here mm -hmm. um was what was going on for me and you know through therapy through finding you know un and also just like finding my fiance who like oh, yeah. amazing and he you know is like the polar opposite of those people yeah. and showing like proving to myself that it's not it wasn't me it was them yeah. um unfortunately and it had nothing to do with my character and everything to do with what they were going through or what they were experiencing um you know and it took a lot of time like it definitely it takes took. so much time yeah time is and trust was a huge issue oh like gosh. Connor and I, when we first started dating yeah. like yeah I was you know and that's and it's part of it you know recognizing that that is part of it but I think the more that you can prove to yourself and come to realize that it's not about you it, it had everything to do with that person and yeah. it does help um but it takes it takes time and my therapist is also someone who explored a lot of that with oh me. that's so that's so great having a therapist through something like that you know it's it's one of the most human feelings but it's you know it's never it's never easy it never gets easier it's it's horrible I think also like I would say for me um 
diving into yourself like actually I started Elohim because I was going through like a crazy crazy breakup and or heartbreak I would say the breakup was just kind of a normal you know let's go our own ways but it just it broke me to the point where I was like okay I'm either like giving up on everything or I'm gonna like make this time like all about me and this that's what I did I I literally I just dove into my art and my my music that was like why this project was born you know and so I'm actually like I think that breakups can be like the greatest blessing in life too I mean think about it's like aren't you like don't you like give thanks like that's something I'm grateful for I'm so happy that like I got broken up with (laughs) and like this thing ended (laughs) think about it too like when you're in a relationship a serious relationship like you give up a part of yourself a hundred percent you know and so like those times where you might be spending doing things for you or just things you simply enjoy like it's a it's a give and take it's a two-way street and so like it then doesn't become it's not a two-way street anymore it's a one-way street and you could do whatever you want to do yes it's really yeah it can be very empowering I think the beginning of it is really hard and so heartbreaking and stay off like Instagram (laughs) but um but yeah I think like really just diving into yourself and you know I I grew so much and then it was even like you know what I'm so grateful that that ended and I also can understand now why it did and like I've changed so much like oh I could see how like I wasn't like the best partner at that time or something you know or they just weren't the right fit for me and I think realizing that is really beautiful as well um oh this is kind of a cool one any advice for people whose parents dismiss anxiety that's very tough hard yeah Um, that's a really tough one yeah I mean can I ask you something sorry I cut you off I was just gonna say when you were how old were you when you were like experience when you were saying like your parents had to stay at the hotel and stuff down the street it went from probably like seven or eight up until I was 15 and so when you're like seven or eight because I had a similar experience but I I wasn't put in therapy and I know you had told me that you were put in therapy and I always say like oh I wish my parents would be in therapy um but you kind of had an interesting you know experience with that and I was just curious did your parents identify this is panic this is anxiety with you when you were that age no I think they knew like something was wrong yeah like that you know but even to this day like my parents still don't fully understand like what anxiety is or what depression is like yeah like I I know they're open to the idea but they like you know like there are times where I'm very irritable you know and instead like it'll just get written off as like oh you know you're just having a, a bad day or something not necessarily like that actually is a symptom of anxiety and yeah. I'm getting overwhelmed right now so yeah it's hard because like they were they wanted me to get help right. um which I'm appreciative of but yeah they didn't know like exactly what was going on they just were like so they're like I'm some i'm identifying something's wrong but i'm not like sure yeah. what it is they're and- just like she keeps crying here <laughs> And did the, did the, do you remember the therapy, like, at that age? Uh, Yeah, I can, like, remember going into the office, like, and I, it was, like, this woman, I don't remember too, too much about it, like, I, in high school, I had, like, someone I, I saw for a little bit, and I remember that a little bit more, she was very dismissive, Mm. um, so you kind of had a weird experience with therapy. Yeah, like, you know, because I think for, for the, I, I always did really well academically, like I was top of my class, involved in all of the extracurriculars and sports. And I think like they saw it as like my functioning was okay, I was doing well. So like, I didn't have to really focus on like the mental health symptoms. But right. like, what really hit me, like, I felt like I crashed into a wall when I went to college, because I didn't have all those distractions, like, or the, all those things to invest my energy into. Right. Um, and that's when it really started plummeting and I started experiencing it. Had I 
maybe had therapists who, you know, understood that a little bit more um, before going to college, I think I probably would have been a little bit more prepared. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. It's, it's really cool that also you can take from those experiences and, you know, help others and sort of give others the experience it's like if if you go somewhere and you don't like the meal that you were given and so then you make it a different way to like make it you know or like the experience of something you know and then you you're able to learn from that which I think is really cool and then give people a really special experience with therapy um it's yeah (laughs) yeah and also like I I want to say too you know I think that not every therapist is like going to be the right fit for you. And like, you don't, do you agree with this? hundred, hundred percent. And there's no hard feelings, right? Like if you're like, you know, you know, it's, it's up to obviously like I would imagine in your place, it's like up to the, you know, person who's coming in to get help. And it's like, you want them to be in the best hands possible for them and it's just like anyone and anything it's you're we're human beings and you know sometimes like it might not work out um and ethically like as a therapist too like it's my responsibility like when I have that consultation call with someone and they're kind of describing their symptoms or they're asking me questions and like if I don't if I know it's not going to be a good fit and like I don't have experience or training in the modality that they might best benefit from like I also have to be like look like I'm very appreciative you reached out to me but let me help connect you with someone else who might be a better fit for you and kind of you know tap into my network because yeah like there's so many different modalities and approaches and therapeutic styles and like I know I'm not for everyone like I have most of my clients that I see in private practice are either like athletes creatives people like who likes fashion and, and sneakers and that's really like what brings them in the door, you know, it's our ability to connect on that. But then and, to also- yeah, and feeling like you're kind of like this, you're a human and you, you know, they can relate on that. That makes sense. Yeah. And like, I'm not for everyone, but I, and just the same as like there's therapists who aren't for me either. So totally it's, it's super important because, you know, the therapeutic relationship is the biggest factor in like your ability to feel confident in opening up about some of these topics that are super vulnerable and also feeling like your therapist gets you and understands what you're explaining and experiencing yeah and feeling safe I mean I didn't feel safe enough in therapy until uh this woman Susan that I went to for a long time I haven't been in therapy in the last year but um you know she I think it was the first time, I mean, it must have been the first time I felt safe enough and, you know, this trust. And it's like, I didn't even open up on really, really serious trauma stuff, you know, until maybe like a year after seeing her, you know? So like, I think you kind of know too when it's a right fit and you kind of feel this feeling of comfort. And so I think it's like, I want to encourage you that if it doesn't feel right and something feels off, like, you know, try it try it somebody else you know have a consultation call with somebody else that's pretty standard right having a phone call before yeah usually like what I would recommend is schedule like three to five consults with therapists oh, and let really them smart you know you can be open like you, if you're the client you're essentially like interviewing yeah. that that person to be the role of your therapist yeah. like yeah that's a really really good idea they're like it's should be they should feel special to be able to be your therapist is like how I kind of view it and like you know also keeping in mind like it's so important to find someone that's a good fit and not settle on anyone because like you're also not going to get anything out of therapy like yes absolutely we're not mind readers unfortunately (laughs) yeah (laughs) but equally is really hard and challenging when we have clients who like you know don't really open up too much and I don't you know I don't expect that to happen off the jump like that's totally normal but it gets to a point where it's like okay what are you coming to therapy for? yeah you with because yeah like it's it gets to be a really big challenge so you want to find someone that you feel okay like talking about all of the things the highs the lows the middles whatever yeah that's it's so true I love the idea I never really thought about that but the idea of 
interviewing <laughs> a few and kind of like setting that up and having you know I think that's really really smart you do want to feel the most comfortable also like you were saying that one therapist you had when you were young was very dismissive and you don't you want to feel like you know I felt like Susan was like a family member almost but in like a disconnected way but in a way like it was very she was very motherly to me like she was very much like I could tell she genuinely cared about me and like would worry about me yeah, you know so interesting because what you were talking about before too with like homesickness and like fe- that feeling of like wanting your mom yeah like, she kind of gave you that feeling <laughs> but, like, if, yeah yeah I know it's so well because I mean she saw me break down and like you know I telling her things I had never told anyone and had been holding on to so it's like and and I and in that moment I realized like wow your therapist really needs to be somebody that you have you know just the utmost trust and that can take time again like I was with her for over a year before I really like broke through on that stuff um yeah. somebody asked what your sign is uh can they type in it if I say to guess what it is, I always love to see what people think. Yeah, I am. yes, please do. So, okay, we want you to guess what her sign is. Um, so, okay, this one is a heavy one, um, but it's a very human one. What are some, and again, feel free to, you know, pass a question because there's a bunch. Uh, what are some techniques to help with grief? I lost my sister two years ago, and I still feel like it's day one sometimes yeah no absolutely grief is a very complicated emotion because there's a lot of stages that come with grief um and no one person experiences grief the same way you know we could jump around from different stages and kind of different stages at different times um And I think with grief, especially like losing a loved one, you know, one, I would really suggest therapy um, to really help process that. And, you know, and not to like, I don't want this to sound dismissive, but like really, you know, trying to remember the good times and the happy memories. And like, you know, with some of my clients, like being able to write, like to write letters Mm -hmm. and keep them in a safe space or getting out anything that you 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 want to say or you want to think about um it's okay to to have those happy memories and to cherish those memories because you know that's they're always going to be part of you but also you know to keep in mind that grief is very complicated and there's a lot of stages and and it can be very confusing and Um, it can be very different for so many people right yeah very different um, some people skip stages. Some people go through, cycle through all of them. Um, and that's why I think therapy can be helpful with this because the therapist will be able to help identify like what stage you're in and what specific techniques uh, or interventions would best help with that stage. Yeah, and there, and there are, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know my therapist who I was going to, she did specialize in, you know, trauma and, you know, losing people close to you so there are I think there are therapists who also specialize in that and it can be so incredibly helpful so 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 helpful I think as just on a very human level like I I often think about is like how are we these like vast amazing things and with all these emotions yet we have to deal with grief it's like how are we equipped to like love something so much and then have it be gone like it's just I don't I don't know I mean it's it's the thing that spins me out the most above anything and like the it was actually what made my therapist tell me she thought I could benefit from medication is because it would just it was something I would think about all day long every day and it became this you know just like obsessive thing that was like really and you know not good for everyday life so yeah I would say definitely oh somebody uh, Megan said I have a directory link for a trauma-informed therapist that she can share that's awesome yeah and any like anything you guys can share is put in you know the discord or a 
a specific modality of cognitive behavioral therapy called trauma focused CBT, which is actually something I'm certified oh, in. Oh wow! One of my the agency that I work for, um, and it's specifically focused on it focuses on CBT for trauma. Um, mm-hmm. It's an amazing, amazing model. So, you know, if you can find a therapist who does that, and also support groups are amazing. Oh yeah, um, I would imagine that support groups would be just incredible. Or even leaning in just on your support system when needed. Yeah. Wait, did I, I'm trying, okay, changing the, I'm trying to find, I've like missed so much. Oh, okay, somebody, <laughs> Irene thinks you're a Leo. Nope. No. Uh, and somebody's a fire sign. I'm a Gemini. Gemini, is that fire? I don't really know much about it. Air. Fire? Air. air. Oh, air. Oh, I love that. I'm so not like a astrology person. I maybe don't really, I don't know anything about it, but um, but I'm Pisces, and I I'm like if you read about Pisces, I'm like Pisces through and through, <laughs> like all the memes. I'm like that's me. <laughs> but air, I like that because you you have a very calming air <laughs> about you. <laughs> not that that's the same air, <laughs> um, but yeah, you have a very calming. And so do you, are you still, do you still accept clients? Yeah. So I'm, um, it's very, it's a weird, we're in a weird time right now. Yeah. Is everything for you on Zoom? Yeah, everything is on Zoom. So the cool thing about, not the cool thing about COVID, but the cool thing about this pandemic <laughs> yeah. that comes to accessibility for mental health services is that a lot of states have loosened their restrictions. So normally when therapy is in person, obviously the therapist you see is in your state or in wherever you're living. So the therapist has to be licensed in that respective state. But now with COVID, oh, wow. have been like relocating, same family members kind of all over the place. So a lot of the states kind of are blurring the lines that like I have clients in other states that I can see right now because wow. of the pandemic. Um, and we're actually trying like there's a lot of petitions floating around to try and change the licensing to make it national rather than statewide. Wow, but that's really cool. Possible. I didn't know that that was a thing. It's that's kind cool. of like, it's it's a weird thing. Um, so right now, yeah, I am actually accepting new clients, but primarily in New York State. Um, yeah. And I'm going to explore getting having my license in a couple other states as well. Uh, but for now, I'm really focused on New York State. Cool. And or like, are you, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, are you open to that? Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Preferably to send an email. Yeah. I'm not DMs, I'll be honest. <laughs> like, oh maybe don't like DM a therapist. Like, maybe just like get her email. <laughs> All the time. Like, and, like, then I go into like ethic mode of like, okay, well, this person's telling me some heavy stuff. I need to reply. I know, yeah. So I was, like, yeah me. that can be really that can be really tough I get a lot of uh, messages too that you know some but I'm I always say you know please seek professional help because you know I'm not a professional I'm happy to you know talk with you on a human level which I think is amazing I think you should talk to friends I think you know or people that you're close with um and do you want to tell us your favorite shoe before we go <laughs> I do mine. I guess I'm a little biased. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait. Okay. I Are these still available? I'm sorry. Okay. This is my Hold favorite out. Nike as well. Hold out in less than two days. Okay. Um, so will you explain this to us? Yeah, it's so edition. rad. 2019 with Nike. And, um, it's called the In My Feels Air Max 270 React. I designed it. It's green to represent mental health awareness. That's the color. Oh, cool. And the heels, one says in mind, the other one says feels. It's like yeah. an option play off of Drake. Um, it says have an NYC day here. <laughs> I like, love that. New York. And then and the, the swoosh. swoosh on the head is wavy to represent that healing is not linear. We always mm, have I love that. That's that's probably my favorite part of the shoe is, well, I love the style of it. I love that it's like kind of high. And then I love the swoosh. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a swoosh that was like, affected like that it's yeah. so so yeah. cool and, and the coolest part is proceeds benefit at the american foundation for suicide Prevention. oh wow that's incredible that's so amazing and w- was that something you had always wanted to do yeah yeah i think it was like that was 
you know, the time where I kind of was able to show that like mental health and sneakers or fashion can really be combined. Yeah. If it, you know, there's ways that I think are good to go about it in ways that maybe aren't the best, but yeah. Yeah, so it was cool, and now I've been able to do a lot. You know, we did our little convo with the hundreds. I know, that was so awesome. Thank Other you. Ones are nice, so, yeah. That was, I still wear that shirt, and it's awesome. <laughs> but, yeah, those are my favorite Nikes. I need to, like, find those on, like, uh, what's, like, the shoe website. <laughs> yeah. What is it called? StockX. Oh, yeah, StockX, and then, like, people sell stuff on, like, Depop. Or something. I don't know. I never, I never buy things like that, but I need those. Um, okay. Anyway, this was amazing. Oh my God. There are oh, 500 on StockX right now, sis. <laughs> That's a chase in the chat. They're $500. <laughs> we need to find those. They should do a re, they you should do like, they should do it like once a year for, you know, mental health awareness month or day. That'd be rad. <laughs> would be very nice yeah <laughs> okay anyway thank you so much for being here I think you are just such an inspiring and you know badass woman the fact that you are not only involved in fashion which I think is so awesome but you know and like kind of the entertainment industry the sports industry um but also you're helping people with their mind and it's the greatest thing ever and I'm so I'm so grateful that I met you I know who you I I met you because I messaged you because I was in a session with Mike Shinoda and he was like oh you gotta meet this girl I feel like you guys would hit it off <laughs> I <don't like. laughs> he's really awesome um I love him but yeah anyway thank you so much seriously this was so so rad and right. I'll talk to you bye. Soon. Say bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. Bye. bye.